Welcome to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast, where we feature top leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry with your host, Drew Hendricks. Now, let's get started with the show. Drew Thomas Hendricks here. I'm the host of the Legends Behind the Craft podcast, where I talk with leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry. Today's episode is sponsored by Barrels Ahead. At Barrels Ahead, we work with you to implement a one of a kind marketing strategy. One that highlights your authenticity, tells your story, and connects you with your ideal customers. In short, we help wineries and craft beverage producers unlock their story to unleash their revenue. Go to BarrelsAhead.com today to learn more. Today, I'm super excited to talk with Ryan Lang. Ryan is the founder and CEO at Middle West Spirits. Welcome to the show, Ryan. Thank you for having me. Uh, Glad we finally got it scheduled. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, absolutely. Sorry for being difficult. <laughs> no, no, no. I, we are we are on, and I am stoked. We have um, we actually have a little bit of a tasting component to our show today. But before we jump into that, how talk to us about how you how you got into the distilling business? Boy, it's been about fifteen years now. Um, I uh, I just had moved to Columbus from Charlotte, North Carolina, and. Uh, was at a company, was an engineer for a company for some time. And I knew I always wanted to kind of start my own business. And this was prior to really any of the craft segment really growing. There was only 40, 50 at the time. Uh, and, uh, you know, the concept behind distilling was intriguing. Mm-hmm. Uh, my family comes from an agricultural background. We own farms in Pennsylvania. So it was uh, it was kind of something that we I wanted to get back to personally. And it was a way to do that without you know, driving a tractor, so to speak. Um, so we started building the case for uh, a distillery and then um, made a trip to Alameda, California and went to uh, Hangar One. Oh, yeah. For- and I uh, met a lot of wonderful people there. You've got a great lot of time. And uh, that was the beginning. And then, you know, a lot of business plan writing later, a lot of begging banks to give us money to get started. Uh, we started Middle West in 2008. See, that, that, was, uh, that was early in the craft distilling movement. It was. It was. It was uh, only, you know, I think we're in the 50s as far mm-hmm. as licenses go. I think. Uh, so what, brought on, what brought on the, the resurgence in all these kind of micro craft distilleries? Well, I think in the brewing world, uh, you saw the proliferation starting to grow. Um, and, you know, distilling was just the next one to take hold. It's, it's a very different model in that you're investing capital today that you often don't see returns for five to you know seven years. So a little bit of a different path forward. But, you know, prior to prohibition, there were about 7,500 licenses, distilled yeah. licenses in the United States. Prohibition obviously ended that uh, run. But as the craft brewing world was taking off and you saw it go from 2000 to 4,000 and so on mm-hmm. and so forth. There was only a natural progression for people to start getting into pioneering craft distilling again, um, outside of the big guys that you would know of at you know like MGP or again Kentucky or in, in mm-hmm. Tennessee. So uh, it started small. I would say it started on the West Coast. That's where a lot of our inspiration came from. And then we ended up meeting a group in Chicago called Coval wow. uh, and uh, Robert and Sonna Berniker there, and they started putting workshops on, and we went to one. And, uh, you know, decided this is what we were going to do and, and uh, started, you know, figuring out how to fail and succeed <laughs> at the same time. And, uh, yeah, it's been 15 years of a lot of investment and growth. And it's, it's crazy. You know, if we were in the 50s, it's in the 3,000, 4,000 range now for yeah. craft distilleries out there. So it's taken off and uh, it's been wonderful to watch and see it grow in Ohio we were one of the first, and I think there we're up to almost sixty now in Ohio. Oh, wow, wow, so. that's interesting. Yeah, just locally here, and I'm based out of Carlsbad and here in San Diego. And one of my favorites is Malahat down in um, Miramar area. But then yep. just just within the vicinity of where I am, there's 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 a there's a few. There's Henneberry's. There's one seventeen West. So I, I love to see the resurgence. But you're you're on a, a little higher level after 15 years going when you just started what what was the first spirit that you started with uh much like everybody uh we started with vodka um mm-hmm. we gotta, we gotta sell something well, well, well we had to we had to so so when we first started like i said our, our 
our background was agriculture. Mm -hmm. So heavily focused on that and tried to find something that Ohio produced well Mm -hmm. that we could turn into our first spirit. And that ended up being soft red winter wheat. Um, And uh, we tested and tested and tested and we distilled our own vodka, which is painstakingly, a painstakingly long process Mm -hmm. uh, for how slow you have to run the still, uh, the stills that we had at the time. And uh, we kind of found our niche around that. And at the same time, we also knew that we wanted to turn that into a whiskey. So while we were making the vodka, we were also laying up the whiskey, but obviously we couldn't release it for some time. So that's where we started and then uh, added a ton of dark spirits and then gins and whatnot. Oh, that's amazing. That's a, that's a great growth story. So on your, mm-hmm. on your vodka, what's the composition? So it's a weeded, vo- it's a wheat vodka. Mm-hmm. And then you've got, a, you've got a gin. What sort of botanicals are in the gin? Uh, so we have the Vim and Petal Gin that, are, that is out right now. Uh, and then we have a new one that we're getting ready to launch this holiday season. Um, and uh, they're very different. The, the first, the Vim and Petal is, is an American dry style gin. Uh, it has a tremendous amount of botanicals in it. And we actually went more culinary uh, mm. when we started it. <clears throat> we took our base OYO vodka. And then we started to botanical infuse it. And we started with 44 botanicals. Uh, We ended up at 18. Mm. And when it was all said and done, uh, and we use things like mace, which is the outside of nutmeg, uh, lapis song tea. Uh, So it's a very uh, culinary inspired product. Yeah. uh, That's got a lot going on. It's um, very uh, savory as a gin. A uh, ton of coriander, uh, but one of the primaries is elderberry, mm. not elderberry flower, elderberry. So these little uh, amazingly flavored products and it's it, the concentration on it's exceptionally high. Uh, so it's it's a pretty unique product uh, for our second gin, which has not been named yet, but will be out here shortly. Uh, we went more London style. Um, so a very traditional London style mm-hmm. uh, and it's only six botanicals. So uh but all, all made here in house, all distilled in house. So. Well, that sounds fantastic. How did you go about coming up with these different botanicals, especially that culinary inspired one? I don't think I've yeah. had it. That. It, it was, uh, um, so we had a chef at the time, uh, mm-hmm. his name was Avishar Barua, um, and he has since moved on and, and started his own restaurants. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he was at our, our restaurant called Service Bar. And, um, you know, when we first started, we were, struggling to get open uh, because of a lot of different reasons. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, it was uh, interesting building that place out on the front of the distillery with uh, legalities of it. Yeah. What challenges did you face when you were first starting out there? Um, Well, there weren't many uh, applications in Ohio, like in a craft brewery, everybody has a a brew pub to the right, the brewery to the left. Uh Um, In Ohio, the laws were not favorable for having that set up. So we had to get a law change first. Oh yeah. <laughs> we did so do so a, a distillery uh, can't have a restaurant next to it. We were not allowed. Mm-hmm. Okay. We were not allowed. So we ended up uh, lobbying obviously, and we did get a law changed, which allowed us to start getting into that. And we had a delay in opening. So in that delay, we already had chef uh, uh, on working with us. So mm-hmm. we're like, Hey, why don't I show you how to run the mini distillation unit? Why don't we come in and why don't we have you go and, and source amazing spices that we can work mm-hmm. with? And he's got a very long uh, list of those that we worked with. And we did. We distilled everything down often, very often. And then we would take and we'd put them together and see what balanced out. Mm-hmm. And some were steeped. Uh, some were added to the pot right at the top point of distillation. Some mm-hmm. were run through a botanical basket. And we found a combination. And even after our third or fourth uh, batch of them, we ended up continually adjusting it. We, we pulled back on the mace and did, did small things, small adjustments. But we, uh, we found something we really liked uh, that was uh, pretty unique for an American character uh, uh, gin. So uh, it was a lot of testing, a lot of tasting. And man, we found stuff that we did not like. Uh, and <laughs> found out right, really quickly, <laughs> it's pretty terrible. Um, but, uh, we found a combination we felt pretty good about. Uh, that's, that's, it's that, it's that testing. It just, I always, I always ask, like, especially, um, been interviewing a lot of like meteries and kombuchas mm-hmm. and there's just, the, there's just such an open field on the amount of flavors you can put in there. And yeah. probably the only spirit that's like that other than cordials is gin on the amount of different combinations. What was some yeah. of the combinations that were didn't quite fly. 
Um, well, we tried different styles of peppercorn, uh, different types of grass blades. Oh. Uh, and it just, I mean, it was wretched. It would come out of this thing. Oh, you could smell it. it was going to go wrong right away. <laughs> so, uh, and then we'd blend them. So mm-hmm. we'd take, you know, a certain portion by volume and we'd blend them together. And sometimes they worked and a lot of times they did not. And the good news on that side is obviously with Avershark's background, he knew the combinations already that he was already using in the culinary world that can work well together. And that kind of led us down a couple of different paths. And uh, we learned a lot. We learned that's, a lot from that. And then that's uh, the thing. it's like the, you almost learn more from what didn't work than what did sometimes. Cause then you'll, yeah. it really just helps you navigate the, that kind of flavor profile. Yeah. I don't think people realize how much effort goes into balancing that stuff. Percentages, volumes, distillation times and temperatures, everything affects the finished product. Oh, so yeah. yeah, it's a lot of, a lot of decisions to be made. And it took us on that one. I want to say it took about seven to eight months to oh, perfect wow. that before it ever went from the lab to uh, the larger stills. Um, so it took some time. And then scaling, it's a whole nother, whole Correct. nother situation. You can get a grade on the micro still, but the flavors don't always just scale up exactly. <laughs> no, they did not. Uh, that's where the adjustments came in. Uh, yeah, we had a product that was in the basket that uh, we wanted to cut out because it was very powerful. Uh-huh. And the first run when we did that, the oils really stripped out of it. Well, the oils happened to be exceptionally yellow. Oh. So when they carried through the condenser and it came out, I'm like, oh my God, it looks like you're in. <laughs> like, yeah, you got the first yellow <laughs> Yeah, I was like, we got to cut back on this next time. So yeah, we, we learned. Oh yeah. So as, as far as scaling, so how did you go about... Um... So you produced it. How did, how did you go about scaling your sales? It's one thing to make it. It's another thing to sell it. It's tough. Um, you know, fortunately, uh, we're in a controlled state in Ohio. Mm-hmm. So it is a very um, different thing to understand the NAPCA states mm-hmm. uh, where you're trying to go to the state and then sell through their distribution channels, whether they're owning it or they're farming it out. Mm-hmm. And in Ohio, in particular, the states, when we first started, they gave us a certain amount of stores. Okay. And we had to support those stores. And uh, over time, we found out what worked and what didn't work. And um, we then found out what the state support needed to be by city. So we went here in Columbus, obviously, and going to Cleveland and Cincinnati and Dayton mm-hmm. and, and the outlying uh, uh, towns to, to cities. And understanding what everybody needed, it just took a lot of years. Uh, we were with a couple different distribution partners for a mm-hmm. while while well, they were technically brokers, but you'd know them as big distribution partners like Republic National and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And um, we ended up going direct ourselves. We ended up managing it ourselves because the state allows us to do that. And oh, wow. um, learned a lot of that from that. For, for years, we toyed with uh, more uh, regional distribution. Uh-huh. So pushing to New York, trying out New Jersey, Washington, DC, and, you know, learned a lot from the challenges there. And uh, we retooled over the last probably four years, brought on a different um, director of sales. He's been doing a wonderful job and we've just expanded our distribution. We just recently announced a partnership with IDN. Mm. So we're with them in 14 states. That's at the independent distributor network. Um, that just, uh, was announced, I think two weeks ago oh, really? and, uh, we're in total, we're in 41 States. I was um, going to ask that 41 States. That's amazing. Yeah. Now t- talk about IDM. I'm, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah. The independent distributor network, uh, much like you have Southern wine. And, Is and this like a, li- a LibDib type of thing? No, no, no. It's a distribution network okay. of, of independence by state. Oh, uh, wow. managed. Yeah. So you can, you can look them up online. Actually, you may be able to find our, our last press release is probably oh, yeah. out somewhere. Um, and uh, they they took over distribution in a lot of our states and are doing really well with it. And, uh, you know, they're they're not as large as, as, I would say they're not as large as Southern and or a Republic National, but they're, they're the perfect fit for us. Um, oh, and we decided to go, we were only with them and I believe, and Victor's probably gonna yell at me, because uh, <laughs> I'm probably gonna get this wrong. But uh, two or three states, and then it it was it's grown quickly to fourteen. Hmm, that's a that's a good channel for um, other other micro distillers that may be listening or craft craft distillers, yeah. just so that they they know that there's other things out there. I know we've kind of talked a little bit with through Speakeasy and some of the stuff yeah. with LibDib, but it's good to know that there's other other channels out there. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, we work with Speakeasy and LibDib as well. So mm-hmm. we're, we, if, if we do DTC, which is, you know, hopefully going to continue to grow in the United States mm-hmm. for our segment, uh, then we've got that channel already set up and I believe they're doing quite well. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a whole new, dist- whole new distribution world over the last, well, since COVID. Uh-huh. COVID really flipped the script and had to, people had to get creative and it opened up a lot of opportunities. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. So let's, um, so you were, we have some sample bottles here that um, oh, yeah. were sent over. I want you to kind of talk to me about your whiskey, your whiskeys, yeah. specifically your sherry cast bourbon and yep. the rye. Yep. So um, we, uh, we're pretty big, like I said, on the agricultural side and, and trying to hone in on things that we, we enjoy working with. And over the last, uh, you know, I would say last 10 years, we really pushed that narrative really hard internally. Um, and we focused on a very specific type of, uh, of corn, mm-hmm. uh, food grade, non-GMO, uh, open pollinated corn, uh, a pumpernickel rye berry, which mm-hmm. is very different than a spooner rye, which is traditionally used in, in larger scale distillates. And then obviously the soft red and the weed. And then, you know, obviously we have to throw in barley malt. So we've got two different barley malts we work with. We work with a two row and a six row, but they became the basis for all of our whiskeys. And by category, obviously to be bourbon, you have to be 51% corn. If you want to be a rye whiskey, 51% rye. So we worked with those four items and then we took their, their percentages up and down. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so are you trying the rye, rye one right. first? Well, right. I was actually trying the bourbon. I didn't know. Okay. I, you can go with, I've got a, I've got a glass here for the rye so I can compare and contrast there. Yeah. They're going to be very different. Um, even though. Yep. There we go. Just so the people on YouTube can see what's going on here. Oh yeah. You got the, you got the heavy one too. The 128. <laughs> yeah. This, <laughs> yeah this, one pack, this one packs a, packs a punch here. Yeah. Cut, so cut, cut um, it with lots of water there. <laughs> The uh, the basis for the whiskeys, obviously, is to produce everything in house and mm-hmm. um, really focus on the agriculture, yeast cells, uh, traditional stuff. What what Kentucky has done for you know mm-hmm. decades, Tennessee's done for decades. Just trying to do that in our own way. Um, and we've been fortunate enough to work directly with a lot of the farms we contract direct. Uh, we actually have our own farm now, mm-hmm. uh, where we've got uh, you know uh, grain growing that we're mm-hmm. going to pay attention to, and um, we uh, we basically alter the percentages based on what we enjoy coming off mm-hmm. the still, and uh, and try to come up with some products that are, are, are unique. So mm-hmm. for the for the bourbon, um, that is a sixty three percent corn, nineteen percent wheat, thirteen uh, percent rye, and the remaining balance is is the barley malt, and that's split between a six and a two row. Mm. And it comes up to what is a weeded bourbon technically because mm-hmm. wheat is the higher grain after corn than anything else, but it's really a four grain uh, bourbon. And then uh, the one you have in particular is we age it for um, four years in uh, regular casks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we flip it into sherry casks for two years. And that's, that's on the bottle listed. And um, we nice brought one. in uh I'm in a sherry casks from Spain for this mm-hmm. and we continue to do that. And that one is a, currently it's a seasonal uh, release. Mm-hmm. We're working on getting it into full scale production uh, just because the volumes are obviously a little bit lower on that. Mm-hmm. It is the basis of what is our, our, our four grain or weeded bourbon, uh, okay. which is the Michelin reserve. Uh, so that you don't have there, but then we take that Michelin and turn it into that. Okay. And, uh, it's got a, a cherry nose to it, a little chocolate on top of the, the bourbon. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been doing quite well for us. It's um, a very elegant drink. It's very, very smooth, um, very round. You can definitely feel the, the sherry, the sherry mm-hmm. head on it is there. Talk to me about the, the Ohio River Valley and what the water, because water plays a good, a lot of importance to whiskey in the oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're on a pretty big water table between Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's a very large water table um, that we have obviously accessed. Um, and then we obviously have to work with that quite a bit where we mm-hmm. are. So we've got specific filtration systems that we use to get the water where we want it to be before it goes mm-hmm. into wash, before we turn it into a mash and then distill it out. And then also, also the, uh, the water for application to the whiskey after it's, it's aged. So yeah, um, very, uh, 
high uh, minerality content water mm -hmm. for us, high calcium, high magnesium. Mm -hmm. uh, it works quite well um, for uh, for fermentation and then also for cutting the product. But yeah, water's <laughs> ridiculously important, mm -hmm. obviously as a component outside of the yeast and then and then the grains. So. Yeah, one of the things I like about your site is you talk about uh, all of your um, kind of partnerships in like mm -hmm. the, the the Spaceside Bourbon Cooperage in Jackson, Ohio. Is that yep. where you source your all your white oak barrels? It is. Uh, yeah, they, we source uh, a lot of them, the majority of them from them uh, currently. And um, yeah, they've been wonderful. We, we talk about serendipity um, as we were growing. Uh, and we were expanding and adding capacity and, you know, changing technologies. We flipped the continuous many, many years ago. And obviously the volume that comes out of continuous is, is much higher than pots. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we needed somewhere to put it. You mm -hmm. need the oak on the other end. And uh, about the same time we decided to ramp up production, uh, we found out that um, in Ohio, there's a group called Jobs Ohio. Mm -hmm. uh, that takes liquor tax revenue and then puts it to good use to try um, and bring economic development to the state of Ohio. And they've, they've done a very good job of that. The recent um, uh, success on that you probably heard was the Intel plant going in near Columbus. Oh, yeah. you know, got, like Jobs Ohio helps with that kind of stuff to bring those people to the area for jobs and growth. They did that for a Cooperage. So mm -hmm. they brought Spaceside in, which is a very old historic uh, recouping company uh, based out of France, but has recouping capacity over in Scotland and Ireland. Okay. And they put a brand new plant uh, for them for fresh make barrels in Jackson, Ohio, where ironically, a lot of oak is. So it's, uh, it would, oh. if you're looking at the map of Ohio, it would be south, southeast. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we ended up going down when they were starting and we met Darren Whitmer, who's the, uh, uh, the head guy there. And I said, hey, you know, we want to really dive into some unique stuff. Uh, would you be willing to work with us on on barrels? And that's from the sherry barrel that you're trying. Mm -hmm. We got that from them uh, because they have a recouping business. They're also pulling barrels back in from Europe. That we can oh, okay. Do. And then on the fresh make side, they allowed us to work with them on some some custom things with our barrels. And we we did. We tailored barrel changes, heating, mm -hmm. cooling char times, things like that. We, we customize that to the, to the individual whiskey. So they've been a great partner of ours for uh, many, many years since they started. And uh, we, we do a fair amount of business with them now. And uh, all of those barrels that come up, they're all very customized for us. It's real nice. Yeah. That's the part that I, when I read it on your site, it's, it's so key. Uh, when you got water, which is a huge component, but if you're aging something six, seven years, four years and in oak, that's going to instill a lot of flavor, a lot of a lot of nuances. What do you look for in your barrels on, the, on um, imparting that type of flavor? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, well, the oak the, in Ohio, obviously, it's what we we want to be as Ohio as much as possible. So, mm -hmm. from an agricultural standpoint, obviously, our water, um, our glass is is about as close as we can be. It's in Manaka, PA, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, Stozel. Uh, now it was Anchor Hawking, uh, but they run that plant there. So bringing the supply chain local has also helped us not run into a lot of the challenges. Yes. It's, it's been out there in the supply chain. Um, doesn't mean our prices haven't gone up. <laughs> they <laughs> They've gone up everywhere, but that supply yeah. chain challenge of the last year on this podcast, it's been the biggest topic that no one wants to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we got, we're fortunate that we're in the breadbasket of what we need to, to mm -hmm. operate. Just have to plan a little better some days. Um, but, uh, you know, with the Oak that we were working with, obviously wanted to be Ohio mm -hmm. and then they took different characteristics of what they knew. So Darren is a former Brown foreman, uh, gentleman. He was at their Cooperage there. Um, a mm -hmm. couple of their other employees have a lot of wine experience. So we were able to work with them on unlocking some of the sugars in a different way. And, and mm -hmm. you think of it this way, this is simplest way. And, and you may know this or maybe some people don't know this, but you know, that, that wood before it's dried down to 4% before we constitute a barrel is, is full of water sugar. Mm. So then if you're taking that and then you're reforming it into a barrel then putting it into an oven and then uh -huh. turning it on fire, you're going to take that sugar, just like the sugar on your stove and turn it into caramel. Mm. Right. And if you leave it on the stove 
for two minutes under mm -hmm. low heat, it's going to be a light yellow color and the caramel is not going to be as rich. If you turn it up too much, it's going to turn dark really quick and it's going to taste burnt. Mm -hmm. Or you can find your happy medium in the middle where it's a good caramel. So it, you're doing the same thing, whether you're using it from direct heat, indirect heat, um, you're doing that to those wood sugars. So we were able to play with that a little bit uh, where our lighter oiled whiskeys, so like wheat whiskey or our rye whiskey, where the oil content coming off the still is not quite as high as our bourbons, mm -hmm. where we were able to, you know, make some adjustments to partner and, and try to find balance within them. Um, and we found the things that we liked and we were able to, to uh, see that happen. Unfortunately, it takes a long time. So we did tests. We would make it much distillates put them in a barrel and we'd say we'd see in two and a half years. That's kind of mm -hmm. our litmus test. Mm -hmm. um, we like to get to about two and a half years to see if it's going down the right path. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, a lot of those changes aren't even market yet. We're not even out with them yet. We're starting to, they're starting to come up of age, but mm -hmm. those changes are made many, many, many years ago. So um, yeah, it's a What's long sort time. of the evolution of the style that you're anticipating that's going to come to market over the next few years. Yeah, I, I hear think, anyone. They don't want their old whiskey to go away. <laughs> just, no, I, I think it's just going to be a development of 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 the age. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the statements are our goal is to get the statement up to a a, a nice level for us. Um, in in our world, in the craft world, obviously, uh, that can be difficult mm -hmm. because you, it's a lot of waiting and a lot of capital. Getting the statement is that like the the amount of age? I'm not familiar. Yeah, with that. The, the the age statement. So oh, okay. that. Yeah, that'll be a pretty big change for us over the next, you know, four or five years. We're, we're making some adjustments there. And then you're just going to see a, just a greater maturation. We really focus on making the whiskeys super soft off the still. That's one of the mm -hmm. things we like to do. So you can take it right off the still and consume it. Uh, you don't need much oxidation to, to do that, mm -hmm. uh, which is what's happening in the barrel. Chemical changes in oxidation. And uh, if we can do that, then we started somewhere, right? And then we just let it sit. Now, we've done that with some of our tests. and. Mm -hmm they've not gone well and oh. then and then we let them sit and then you know a year or two later they'll come right back in line so it's been a fun evolution for us and we're really excited about our next you know we're 15 years in now wow. we're really excited about our next 15. that's what we that's what we tell everybody so now, do you have some 15-year casts aging I wish. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I probably would have sold them three years ago yeah. and well, the, 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 the biggest myth is that like older is always better I mean, what, mm -hmm. in your, what do you think the sweet spot is for the type of um, spirit coming off of your still? Um, I, I would say uh, we would like to get everything to a base of anywhere from six to eight mm -hmm. and then go all the way up to about 17. Okay. So, yeah, that's that's kind of where I think that is. I think uh, rye whiskey at eight to 10 years old, phenomenal. I mean, I like where you are now. We mm -hmm. just, we're going to build up to that. Uh, we like the older bourbon. So our weeded bourbon, I, I think as far as the treatment for that, I think it needs to be at a much more elevated age and we'll work on that over time. Um, so yeah, that's where we're going. Mm -hmm. um, it's just obviously going to take years. So, uh, then, but we're happy with where we are now. So if we're happy now, hopefully we're going to be happy uh, down the road. And these have the aroma of like a, a well-aged um, bourbon, like a lot of, a lot of um, craft distilleries. I don't want to say they cheap, but they just put it in a really small barrel for a short amount of time and it picks up all the barrel flavor, but it still doesn't taste old. You know, and, and we were guilty of that for a while. Um, we, we didn't go below 30 gallons. Mm -hmm. uh, we did 30s and 53s and then hogsheads. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Often too, too much. Um, and it does work. Uh, smaller barrels will get more color. They'll get more extraction. Um, but there it's missing the oxidation. It's missing that age that knows the feel. And, and, and often I think it's, it's pretty hot. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. it, it's uh, just a, the heat does not go away. So um, yeah, we, uh, we flipped the 53s uh, many years ago and we still work with thirties for some of our clients. Mm -hmm. um, but uh yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about because we had that had, had that happen. So it's, I see it in wine too, where they go, put the oak staves in or the chips, and you you can just tell that they kind of cheated the cheated the the aging of the wine a bit. I mean, it's not bad. It's just not it's not the same as laying it down for a couple of years. In if the you 
if you work with it, you pick it out real quick. Mm -hmm. You can see what was, was done. Um, not that it's, you know, it's, it's somebody's business model, right? Mm -hmm. If that's what you need to do, then all more power to you. There's a Um, bottle for every pellet, you know, there is. And, and we, we, uh, we've played with a lot of those things and we, we know what our true North is. We're just running towards it. Yeah. You, you mentioned, um, for some of your clients, you still use some, the, the 30 gallons. Do you do some private production? We do. Yeah, we do. Uh, we do private label. Uh, so we work with a handful of customers on vodka side, whiskey side, um, you know, a couple different products that are out there. Uh, I'm, I don't know that I'm allowed to say what they yeah, are. Yeah, 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 yeah. but it is, it is a percentage of your business. And that makes sense, yeah. too, if you've got the production facilities. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think the thing that we we often say is that we have strategic partnerships. Mm-hmm. So we work with companies and we we work with them on barrels, mm-hmm. sourcing them, blending them, bottling them. Uh, we uh, we like to see their brands thrive because mm-hmm. if they're thriving, then that means we're, we're doing our job for them, which is what we always want to do. And we've had some good successes with that. And we're really proud of those guys and seeing what they're doing. Um, so, yeah, it's it's helped us a lot too, in turn, um, understand how to communicate better. And, and to, you know, be um, the backbone of some of the, the brands that, that need that. Mm-hmm. And it's helped our internal team grow um, because we've had to we've had to be very nimble and bringing on new technology and uh, and invest in that. And we've mm-hmm. done that. And uh, what, what sort of technology have you um, invested in? Um, different filtration systems. Mm-hmm more tanks blending mm-hmm. better dumping machine like everything that needs for speed volume uh higher production capacity um and then uh you know just learning quickly you know the, the challenge you get into i i honestly believe is with craft and there's no school for this by the way mm-hmm. it's not like you go to a brewing school right so mm-hmm. what what you're trying to take is a standard that is exceptionally high think about that kentucky tennessee Seagram's yeah. MPI, their standards are very, very high. They've been running for very, very long. I mean, most of those brands are pre-prohibition in, in some way, shape, or form. Uh, they may have changed hands, but that technology, the the yeast development and the equipment that they've been working with, which works forever, mm-hmm. as long as you maintain it, that's institutional knowledge that is exceptionally mm-hmm. deep and backboned. And you got a craft guy coming on and you're like, wow, I'm going to, I'm going to get into this. I'm going to figure this out. Mm -hmm. Well, that is a steep mountain. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you're trying to not tarnish the category, and if you're trying to put something on the shelf that somebody's going to buy, not once, but hopefully two, three, four, five Mm continuing, then it's, it's a deep challenge. So as, as we've grown, and we've watched our brands and, and our partner brands grow. You know, we've all risen together, I would say. Mm-hmm. And um, it has forced a lot of the things through that maybe we wouldn't have looked at yeah. right away. So, uh, and the other thing is we've been fortunate that when we did ask the question and we needed somebody to, you know, for us to bend an ear on, uh-huh. most people listened and most people responded. Oh, so that's great. Yeah. So like talking about in scaling and the inflection point, I mean, I visit a lot of these um, craft distilleries that are basically just a warehouse and a still and see mm-hmm. a couple of barrels behind them. How, what, what's that inflection point where between like that warehouse to where you are now, like there was a, there was a big shift. If you look at, I mean, that your website, you have a fantastic looking facility. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, for us, it was 2011. Um we had gone down the path of blending uh, mm-hmm. a product, uh, putting somebody else's product in ours and seeing how it do in the market. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, it's, it's an easier way to get product in and out. And we were going to give it a shot because we recognize that uh, infrastructure is capital intensive. Mm-hmm. Uh, your output is very little, especially if you have a, thousand gallon fermenter in the wine world you're keeping the majority of that in the distilling world you're dumping the majority of it right okay. you're, keeping, yeah. you're keeping eight percent so eight eight and a half percent so um you know back then when money was very difficult uh to come by uh we're we're still family and independently owned 
So it was in 2010, that, that there was not a lot of free money going on there. <laughs> no, it was tough. And uh, we went in to get a, a lot of barrels that we, we had secured. Mm-hmm. And we went to get them and they were gone. Somebody oh. else had bought them. So that kind of shifted our plan quickly, um, which was fine. It wasn't that many, but it was an eye opening. It, it was very eye opening. And uh, we have a background in, in manufacturing engineering. So we're like, hey, that's what we do. Mm-hmm. Um, why don't we? focus on infrastructure, mm-hmm. develop it, and then continually develop it. Mm-hmm. And that was a big year. And it took a couple years to figure out how to get that running uh, from a capital standpoint and from a space standpoint, lots of lots of work there. But um, yeah, it, it was the inflection point for us in saying, hey, we, we're going to go into this. This is not mm-hmm. going to be a little bit where our anticipation is mm-hmm. to be a lot. And we focused on that. Uh, put the plant in um, and then added some more stuff and we continually add every year and more warehouses, more storage. Uh, we open service bar uh, to bring more people in. Uh, we're in Columbus, which sees a lot of people uh, on an annual basis, but we 10 X our visitors when it opened. So when did, when did service bar come online? 2017. 2000. Okay. So that's, that, that's, that's some good timing because you're not pre pandemic where you could build a base. Yeah. So talk to so many people. They came online in 2020. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you, I talk about a shutdown. Oh my gosh. It was, it was an immediate shutdown. I mean, it was a discussion on a Friday and we're done on a Tuesday. Yeah. It was crazy. We had 22 people we had to furlough. So we had to figure out how to take care of as many people as we could. Um, so we flipped to a takeout model. Mm-hmm. And I think three or four weeks. And I will say this, we, we didn't make money during that period. Uh-huh. On takeout. We, we kept people employed as many as we could. Um, oh, it was a big mess. So important. Yeah. So the, um, so 17, we opened, uh, it wasn't for a full year. 18 was our first full year, then 19 and then poof, 2020. Yeah. And uh, we went to the takeout model until the summer when things started opening back up. Mm-hmm. It didn't make sense for us to remain open. Uh, and we shut down. We did renovations. Mm. Uh, we're actually getting ready to reopen in a few weeks here. Oh, cool. So, yeah, thank God. I'm, I'm excited well, to, to have a burger and a, a bourbon at my bar. So. Yes, I, yeah, I would be too. I, I'm, I'm excited and I can't even visit right now. Um, but that leads me right into the the question I have about hospitality. Because you, you had kind of a hospitality component from the start, changing the laws around. How has how has that hospitality helped you and evolved over the last you know twelve years? Yeah, um, I, I think I, it, the benefit to us and how it has evolved is visibility impressions, mm-hmm. right? Um, craft distilleries back you know in 2010, 2012, mm-hmm. when you go to a distributor, talk to them about, hey, I got all this product, I'd like for you to sell it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, how are you going to get, it was a pure push as opposed to a pull. Mm-hmm. Um, there was no way to get you or the regular consumer to recognize that that industry was growing. Craft beer was obviously taking off, but, um, that segment was difficult, uh, to deal with, to try and get into that distribution. Uh, we had seen a lot of our, our, uh, peers in mm-hmm. Chicago and Pennsylvania and other places where they had tasting rooms. Uh, which we could still do a tasting mm-hmm. room. But then when you saw people open up to actually adding in what I would call the brew pub, mm-hmm. uh, their their foot traffic changes and then the brand changes. And then it just takes time. Mm-hmm. It's, it's nothing you can expect to blow up overnight, my personal opinion, to go from X amount of followers to X, you know, Y amount of followers online and people talking about you. It just takes diligence, hard work and time. Um, I will say that the hospitality portion and opening that up accelerated that had we not had that the time would have taken even longer to get the impressions that we have to put the brand out there in a way that we could reinvest in it uh, and mm-hmm. continue to grow it so it, it was a great thing for us uh, we're really excited to reopen it we're adding some other places for us uh, in the future oh, cool. so i think for us rolling forward it's going to be a good touch point for us we believe in having good food good drink Mm-hmm. and having you know a decent time that's that's really the mantra of, of the business and it's in, on our website and whatnot but we really believe in that so we're pretty passionate about what we try to put into that bottle and it extends to the restaurants we're very careful about our food menu 
um, who the chefs are and what they're doing. And, uh, you know, we don't, we don't have the turns of big restaurants because people kind of camp out, but yeah. we, we hope they leave with an experience. And that's that the reminds idea. Reminds them of us. So that's the idea of that experience. Cause you, you have a whiskey, the whiskey is a brand positioning and you want to, you want to kind of, by having the by controlling the hospitality experience, you get to kind of show the entire brand vision yes. uh, with the food, the environment, and even the, the cocktails, the the whole craft cocktail movement, which I think really, I think the pandemic really helped accelerate the um, fancy, oh, yeah. fancy cocktails because people were at home, they had time to be their own mixologist. And you've got some fantastic cocktails on your site right now. Who comes up with these sort of new new mixes? We have, uh, uh, we've had over the years, several, um, head bartenders mm -hmm. that, uh, that do lead that pack to creating our, our cocktails and what you see online. And then we have other guys that also are, are part of that. We have a whole team that comes up with them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I think my big thing is really take the classics mm -hmm. and, and make them uniquely ours, mm -hmm. you know, Manhattan. Old fashioned. We have a barely aged old fashioned. Oh my gosh, it's so good. Like, um, I love a good old fashioned. Oh, it's it's my go to anywhere. Um, and uh, you know, we've given the bar a lot of creative freedom with that. But that's mm -hmm. all we ask is that when you're putting out, be classic driven mm -hmm. with our twist, and then play around if you want. Um, what would there, see your yeah. house style twist is for Middle West? I'm sorry. What would be your house style twist of the, what the um, uh, bar should be? Old fashioned, right? Mm -hmm. Just what we done with that. So it's not a regular pour. We we rebarrel it. We barrel age it. We oh. barrel age old fashioned, and then we do not use maraschino cherries. Uh, we don't use cherry juice. It's primarily liquor and orange driven. Oh. So it's got um, bitters and then lots of orange zest. So uh, you get something pretty spectacular in that glass. What type um, of bitters are you using? Well, you're asking proprietary. <laughs> <laughs> I know it tastes good, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it, it's it's pretty fun to watch what they come up with. And over mm -hmm. the years, I mean, we've had things burning, mm -hmm. we've had smoke, we've had barrel aging, mm -hmm. um, pretty creative stuff, egg washes, you name it. But uh, it's pretty nice for our staff to be able to take what is made behind that wall right there. Mm -hmm. And then convert it into something at that bar that people get to experience and it tells our brand story. So you're right. That is absolutely what it is. Um, and we're just going to continue that. It's a model that works um, for us. Mm -hmm. And we hope to continue to add to that. Our, our hope is our hospitality uh, grows over the next 15 years as well with that. I think it probably, I think, well, probably, I, th I definitely think it will because I think it's the missing link that a lot of these um, distilleries are not embracing and, and we're seeing it a lot i mean i i had a few kentucky bourbon producers on the show and what they're doing like in bardstown and some mm -hmm. of their facilities is just next level it's it like it's like embodying what's what's going on in some of the wineries yes just that whole towards towards the experience and the hospitality yeah that, that's absolutely what we've been working on for you know the past probably i would say eight years mm -hmm. uh, as far as the vision and now we're with uh, the addition of the new staff and the, and the new places that we're adding, we're going to just continue to accelerate that. I, I think that experience in Bardstown does such a nice job. Of it. It's, it's phenomenal. So, uh, you know, why not? And, and that is part of the whole thing. Um, the wineries in California, Italy, France have done that for a long time. It's that experiential mm -hmm. piece, even the, the Scottish and Irish distilleries, there's a huge component to that where they want you to hit the pause button and stick around go look at the place but yeah. stay and then um you know that's that's uh brand value yeah. um it, it's hard to put a price tag on that but if you can create an experience for people you know they may not be for everybody yeah you never win everybody over but you can win some of them yeah i did my um ireland distillery tour one week before the country was shut down for covid oh no so way we had, like, we had the last pre-covid just hoopla it was fun nice Dingle did you see all. uh did you go to Kilbegan? we didn't go to Kilbegan. We, we, okay. we yeah we did um yeah dingle and then um jameson middle jameson middleton, middleton. middleton red breast it was yeah. it was it was a good experience and it was it it was something where you had to be there and i think just coming to your place middle west it, by just experiencing it you get so much more insight into the into the spirit 
I have yeah. to ask you, as we're kind of wrapping down here, I have to ask you, how do you stay motivated 15 or 12 years into this? <laughs> I mean, uh, wait, wait for the 12 It's, it's a really out. funny week to ask me that. Too. <laughs> it took me a little bit longer to get in the office this week than normal. <laughs> uh, long country drives. Um, I, I guess it's uh, staying motivated is our, our staff mm-hmm. and, and seeing what they're doing and seeing when we succeed for something that they've done. Uh, you know, we've got some guys that are getting um, through the plant, their product that they started to produce, you know, five, six years ago is now starting to come out and uh, seeing that work for them. And honestly, uh, with the long term vision of what we try to do, which is, you know, to be um, hopefully respected for what we do uh, and to be a national brand, which is what mm-hmm. we're working on. Um, you know, we're not there yet. Mm-hmm. So there, there's a drive to get to that level. Um, are, are some of the days harder than others? For uh-huh. sure. Um, it is still a, it's a dog eat dog world in the category. And it's a volume business. Don't let anybody kid you. It's mm-hmm. uh, it's, it's a very, it's true, truly a volume business. So we take our lumps and we move and we have our successes as well. So that's it. You just dig in and I'll tell you the, the staff is really helping my family also really helps my wife and my kids are pretty forgiving for how much work you have to put into this. Um, but yeah, if you see them every day, man, they drive it. They come in, they know what they're doing, they execute, and it's working. Mm-hmm. So we just need more time. Oh, well, yeah, I can't, I can't wait to see how these whiskeys evolve. I mean, the, if yeah. the six years, any indication, and you think that reaches a peak up to the 17. Well, people are, yeah, right. Well, yeah, that, that's that's the motivation. I mean, we'll, we do our, our barrel selects, we taste every barrel before we put it into a bottle. At least we know it, we get, make sure it's correct and you know, rate and whatnot. And you'll get those unicorns every once in a while. And man, when they're right, yeah. <laughs> it's immediately take it out, put it over in a single barrel room. Don't touch it. Yeah. So yeah, I would like for more of our barrels to be as good as a single barrel. And that that's really what we're, what we're trying to do. Yeah, that's, that's enough to keep, I would keep me motivated for sure. Yeah. So as, as we're kind of wrapping up, is there anything we haven't talked about that you want to bring up or? No, no, I, I just appreciate you letting us come on the show and introduce us to maybe some new customers um, and, uh, you know, spending time with us and invite you out. I know you're yes, I on definitely the uh, sunny West Coast, but if you ever find yourself in the Midwest, uh, the door's open. So. No, I need to make a trip. I, every Everything on this show, every of these, like, I haven't had a really a need to go to Columbus, but now I'm kind of dying to go. <laughs> <laughs> One out. <laughs> it's a great city. Yeah, no, it's, it sounds fantastic. And getting a hamburger in this bourbon would be fantastic. Well, gosh, thank, thank you so much for joining us. Where can people find out more about you and Middle West? Yeah, you can go to our website, MidwestSpirits.com. It has our links to our Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, a lot of our uh, material releases are on our, and on our LinkedIn. You'll see a lot of our press releases there as well. So you can connect to us there. Um, we're, there's an order form on there on our MidwestBeers.com that actually takes you to Speakeasy's site. Oh, yes. It looks like ours, but it's there. So some of the states in the United States can ship. And then over over time, if you ask your uh, uh, your state stores or your liquor stores for it, um, we're slowly creeping into the states. Uh, we may be at a door near you soon. Yeah, I can't wait to see your continued success. Ryan, thank you, thank you so much for joining us. And I appreciate it. Uh, you have a wonderful week and weekend. Oh, you too. Thank you. We'll see you. Thanks for listening to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes. Uh